Something incredible happens when you become a designer that I liken to gaining a superpower. Most people are walking around the world thinking about what they want to eat for lunch or what they're doing at work, but designers are walking around the world looking at everything and asking, why does it look the way it does and work the way it does and who designed it? And the great part about this ability is that as a designer, I can do something about it. The obnoxious part about this ability is that it's happening all the time. I can never shut it off. And for me, this is happening particularly with typography. <laughs> typography is the visual arrangement of designed letters or type in space. And type exists everywhere, even if you find yourself in the middle of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where I'm from, at Fayette Historic Town Site and Park, where I found myself in the summer of 2012. I was there on a whim, and what Fayette is, is it used to be a town where they smelted iron ore that was mined. What that means is it's made into a more refined version before it gets shipped off to be made into steel. And so this was a company town. It was a really cool, bustling place where they did this for about 20 years at the end of the 1800s until it proved unprofitable and the whole town kind of trickled out. And now it's a ghost town. It's been really well preserved as this architectural kind of framework uh, that now you can go visit. And they have a cool museum there that has artifacts from the town. You can see how people used to live there. And in this museum, they have these white framed pieces of paper that were kind of up against a wall, which from a distance looked entirely unremarkable. But as I got closer to them, I was totally floored. This was the most beautiful handwriting I had ever seen in my entire life. It was graceful, and it was swooping, and it was swift, and it was fantastic, and suddenly, like a ton of bricks, my design superpower caught up with me, and I knew in my heart of hearts that I needed to make this into a typeface. <laughs> the problem was I had never actually done this before. <laughs> I had worked as a graphic designer and used a lot of type, but hadn't made a lot of type. And so I knew there were a couple things that I was going to have to consider moving forward if this is a project I wanted to do. So the first thing to know, I needed to know, is that a typeface is different than a font. Now most people use these interchangeably, but there actually is a difference. A typeface is a series of letters that are designed to belong together. So Bodoni is a typeface. Now Bodoni bold italic is a font which is a specific group of letters within a typeface. So fonts make up typefaces in the same way that chapters make up a book. All typefaces are made up of letter forms. Letter forms is the individual design of any one letter. And when you're designing these letters, you have to consider if you want it to be a serif or a sans serif typeface. So what serifs are, are these like great little feet that exist on the bottom of letter forms, like you can see on the century F. And sans serif type, uh, san from the French word meaning without, uh, doesn't have these little wings or feet, and so they read a bit more like table legs. Then there's script typefaces, which is made to look a bit like cursive. And so when you design the letter forms, you have to add this cool little tail onto what you're designing so that they can connect with each other and read like cursive. And I knew, because I was working from cursive handwriting, that I needed to design a script. So I thought, I've got this, right? I'm just going to trace the letters, and it's going to work. <laughs> it really didn't. So I had this, and this would have worked really well for historical preservation, but what went on is that these letters weren't even enough to actually work as a typeface, and so then I was kind of back to the drawing board, going, all right, uh, how am I going to actually do this? And so I thought about how other type designers had done this before me, and many of them start with the letter A. Now I have to preface, I absolutely love lowercase a's, which is like a little weird and obsessive, I realize saying this in front of a very large group of people, but <laughs> lowercase a's 
are fun, they're humble, they're in just about everything. And so I started by tracing this A, which looked really funky, and the second A looked really funky, and probably somewhere until like the 39th A also looked really funky. But when I finally got to this A that I loved, I knew it was a really great place to start, and I knew why other people started there. Because once you have that letter form, you can use that to make an O and a G and a P and a Q and a D and a B because they all share that same base shape. Similarly, once you design an N, the M and the U come really quickly, as does the W and an H because they borrow each other's forms. Now, once you've designed these letters, it's important to space them correctly. That's just as important. And so kerning is the space between any two letters. And letters uh, that are close together are tightly kerned, and letters that are far apart are widely kerned. And for Fayette, which is what I call the typeface, super creative name, <coughs> I know, these have to be properly kerned so that it maintains this illusion of cursive and that it reads really nicely. Because if things are too tightly kerned, then it turns into this crunchy mess. And if it's too widely kerned, then you've completely uh, ruined the illusion of cursive. And kerning is important not just for believability or legibility, but because it can actually change what it is you're trying to say. And my first lesson in bad kerning was not in art school, but was actually in the seventh grade with Mr. Stewart. This guy loved bird watching. So he got up and he wanted to share this with us. So he got up on the board and he wrote down the name of a bird called the yellow-bellied flicker. But he wrote it really quickly and his letter spacing was just slightly off and this completely changed the message. <laughs> this is a true story. Other things to consider is about letting, and letting is the space between any two lines of typed text. And it's called letting because when uh, type was made of like movable metal, they literally put chunks of lead between to designate that space. And for Fayette, this was really <laughs> important because I had to deal with ascenders and descenders. So what an ascender is, is it's the part of the letter form that comes up and over the X height, which is the top of lowercase letters. And then there's the uh, descenders, which come down below what's called the baseline, which is where lowercase letters sit. And so if something is too tightly leaded, then you end up with these like sword fighting ascenders and descenders, and that's generally bad news bears. Other things to consider is that when you're designing a typeface, it's not just 26 letters and 10 numbers. You have to deal with things called glyphs, which are all of the symbols that you have to have in a typeface, like the at sign and number sign and, and parentheses, right? So that your typeface is actually usable. So there is at least like one person in this audience right now who's like, good for you, lady. You made a typeface. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> There's one of you, I know it. What's the point? The point is that typography is important not just for designers and type nerds like myself, but for everyone in this audience because everything you ever read is in some kind of typeface. And all typefaces are designed to say something specific. And so when something is typed in a typeface, then what is said is influenced by how it is set. And I call this a kind of visual inflection. So just like when we speak, our tone of voice gives meaning to the words we're trying to say, so does type. So if I were to say, I hope you all have a great time today at TEDx, you know I mean that because of the tone of my voice, right? But if I were to say, I hope you have a great time at TEDx. <laughs> you know that I don't actually mean that because of the inflection of my voice and type works really similarly. Type can be authoritative. It can be honest. It can be organic. Type can say, I'm friendly or I'm childlike. And if you're still not buying this, 
Let's imagine that you're going out on a date and you need to get a babysitter for your child. So you go online and you look up babysitter and this shows up, okay? Set in Baskerville, it's cool, it's calm, it's professional, it's collected. This is probably a person that you'd give a call and say, hey, can you watch my kid tonight? But let's say that this situation has changed slightly. So you get online, you look up babysitters, and this shows up. <laughs> this is probably not the person you want to leave your kid with. So in this way, type should never be an afterthought because it can persuade and evoke and help us make choices consciously or unconsciously. And so Fayette is a nice typeface and I'm obviously like a tiny bit biased, but it's not for everything. It works really well for things like historical fiction or museum design or love letters or wedding invites because it speaks of a time of precision and a time gone by, but it's not what you'd write like your master's thesis in. And that truthfully, that wasn't the point, right? I didn't design it to be the end all, be all of typefaces. I designed it to say something about a place that used to exist and doesn't anymore, and a person who had a voice and doesn't anymore, and that swiftness and that beauty, in some way trying to preserve that and carry a tiny bit of that from the past to the present and hopefully into the future. And so for all of you now, having heard this talk, you now absorbed a little bit of this design superpower, which means when you leave, you're gonna go look at all of the type around you and you're gonna wonder who made it and why it looks the way it does and what it means. And you're also gonna see bad kerning now everywhere. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but you're all gonna be able to go into your chosen professions and handle type a little better than you could before because you can think about what you wanna say and how you want to say it. And you can make conscious deliberate decisions about the medium of your message, not just from the words you choose, but from the type you choose. Thanks.